So let's start with cricket on this fantastic Friday. And speaking of fantastic, that's how many people would describe the West Indies' performance on day two of the second test against England at Trent Bridge, trailing by just 65 runs in the first innings reply, led by a centre from Kamim Hodge, playing in just his fourth test. The 31-year-old stroked his maiden 100, a well-constructed 120, to become the first Dominican player to score an overseas tonne. He was joined by his countryman Alec Athenes, who scored 82 as they staged a fighting 175 run fourth wicket stand. The Windies were 351 for five at stumps, with Joshua De Silva 32 and Jason Holder 23 at the crease in reply to England's 416. Shoa Bashir is so far the pick of the English bowlers with two for 100, and uh, that is the story so far after two days on a point of clarity we said Kevin Hodge is the first Dominican to score an overseas test hundred that's because Irvin Schillingford in 1977 scored a test hundred at the border ground in Georgetown Ghana to become the first Dominican to score a test hundred Fazir Mohammed had front row seat today to see Hodge's innings and Athenaeus as well he joins us to recap the day's play. Faz, a very encouraging performance today from the West Indies, putting their heads down, and the two Dominicans, the star of the show. Very encouraging, very heartening, and it really sets things up beautifully for the remainder of this test match, if the weather allows, because from what we understand, the, the heat of the last couple of days would have uh, really been a precursor to some showers that are due sometime during the course of the weekend. But let's see how it goes. But uh, indeed, after yesterday's performances and we were lamenting the missed chances and the errors in the field and so on, uh, well, the West Indies, especially with that uh, Dominican pair of uh, Hodge and Athanas, uh, they, they really played superbly. And now they stand within 65 runs of England's first innings total with five wickets in hand and really in with a chance of making this a, a proper contest and who knows, making it one all. Yeah, you will remember, Faz, that uh, when the Sports Max Zone started back in 2011, Waver Hines was one of the presenters on this show and he constantly told us that one of the reasons why the West Indies would struggle in international cricket is because it takes a longer time for our players to develop because the infrastructure of uh, West Indies cricket is not like it is in some of the other bigger countries like Australia, India and England and so on. So I say that to say this, um, Kevin Hodge is 31 years old now and he is just getting the hang of international cricket and although he showed quality as a teenager, um, it, it, it has taken him this kind of lengthy period to be um, coming to grips with what is required to score well in international cricket. Indeed he has, and, and this is one of the challenges, but uh, as a counter to that, we have young players who come to the fore as well, like Alec Athena. So, you, so, so there you have two elements of it. Uh, we have to wait and see if Athanas will be able to sustain it and go on for a few more years uh, as, as far as having a good, promising uh, test career. Uh, but but you're right, in the case of, of, of Hodge, we, we've had the same situation with Nkrumah Bonner, who took a long time after playing uh, one limited over international match to finally get a test opportunity in 2021. He started in a blaze of glory and then fell off the boil, had some problems facing short pitch bowling, now he's out of the scene altogether. So it's really a combination. It's a mixed bag. It's a true Caribbean Kalaloo when you're talking about these situations because you do have some young talent coming to fore that is able to sustain it if given the opportunity. And you do have players like Kevin Hodge coming on onto the scene and eventually getting the opportunity and making the most of it as we saw today. Yeah. And can you speak more specifically, Faz, on the sort of grueling period that the batsmen had to go through with the Mark Wood pace because he was 90 miles per hour consistently for for a spell i heard Kevin Hodge in the uh, at the end of the day's play talking to the press he did admit that he had never been in uh, a situation where he was facing that kind of sustained pace and uh, given that that fact um does the batting effort from the west indies team today take even more credit for their determination Absolutely. And, and you, you know, Lance, because we've grown up in the Caribbean, 
with, with genuine peace. You, you could see the difference at the ground. I mean, the ground was almost full. And from the moment Mark Wood came on to bowl, second change, first, sorry, first change, uh, and, and the, the pace he was generating, you could hear the buzz and, and you could see the difference in how the West Indies players responded because they had to certainly sharpen up their movements and had to be much more aware. Uh, we, we, and in fact, the feeling is that when you have someone with such raw pace, creating such discomfort and intimidation at one end, the wickets might actually fall at the other end. So then you had Shoy Bashir taking nothing away from the off-spinner, was able to pick up a couple of wickets. Gus Atkinson bowled a short ball into the body of uh, Craig Brathwood, and he fended off a catch. But uh, again, would probably on another day not have bowled as well or with such sustained pace and have much more success. And indeed, he should have had Kavim Hodge, who was dropped a straightforward catch with slip for 16. But this is how it goes sometimes in the game. England had their good fortune yesterday. Kavim Hodge had his today. And he certainly made England pay a very heavy price and did the West Indies a, a tremendous good with, with his effort. But yes, those periods of play with the bowling of Mark Wood and the West Indies taking him on or just looking to survive against him, that, I think that was really the most enthralling periods of play on a really enjoyable second day's play here. Yeah, and Faz, you know, it's so good, so positive to be able to talk about that century and especially that partnership between Kavem Hodge and Alec Atenez. But for me, you know, there's still that glaring discussion about um, mm -hmm. batsmen getting starts, not capitalizing on it. And of course, the openers. Again, um, Craig Brassweight had 48. Mikhail Louis gave us a glimpse of what he can do. But still, getting the start and not capitalizing on it continues to be a massive discussion. What I would like to have been happening for the rest of uh, day two today, after they got out, was for uh, Mikhail Louis and Kirk McKenzie to be sitting there in the dressing room saying, you know, I really should have been out there scoring those runs. Yeah. Because I, I'm sure they would have been telling themselves, look, you know, I had an opportunity today on a good batting surface, excellent weather, because it was almost Caribbean warm today, that this was the opportunity to really take advantage. But it was, as you said, it was disappointing to see the way Mikhail Louis got out. He was clearly looking to target the spinner for the big hits. He got a boundary off the inner portion of the bat, attempting to repeat the shot. Uh, he, he went and, and a good catch taken uh, by Harry Brook running back. And, and, and then just before lunch, you saw Cook because he's playing a really poor shot looking to hoist over Medan and the catch taken by Ben Stokes. That, that's really not the way you would think that they, they, they would want to play the game. And therefore, when you saw that stand between the two of uh, the pair of Dominicans, I'm just hoping that people like Mikhail Louis, people like Kirk McKenzie will say, you know what, this is really opportunities missed for me. And the next time, if it's there's the second innings for the West Indies, as we, we think there would be in, in this match, you take advantage of the opportunity. You don't let opportunities like this go a begging. And I'm just hoping that they're looking back with pride on the West Indies overall effort and their teammates, but with regret as to what they missed out on. Yeah, especially when it's a good batting surface, because, you know, one of the first things we love to say is, okay, the pitch didn't do what it had to do for the batter, so, you know, we get away with that. But on a good batting surface like this, any batter would want to get a big score. Now, between the wickets, we have Jason Holder, a man with a lot of experience, and Joshua De Silva, somebody I think can also go on to make a century if he applies himself. What are you thinking for day three, Faz? Well, these two players, let's not forget, have big runs against England. Yes. Jason Holder has a double century against England, 2019. He has 100 against them, a match-saving one from 2015. Joshua De Silva, um, at his only Test 100, has come against uh, the same English in Grenada. So those runs have come in the Caribbean. Uh, Holder was very, very fortunate to survive. And, and in fact, the, the, the ball went past his head so many times, you have to say that, 
if he continues with that luck tomorrow, he could probably get a 50 and who knows, maybe even a 100. And Joshua De Silva was far more positive, far more forthright, far more confident with his shot making. So, so, so really, it's now for them to continue. And yes, it's a good day for the West Indies, but every day starts anew. The ball is virtually brand new because just one over has been bowled with the second new ball. And we can expect that Mark Wood is going to be coming again, firing on all cylinders, looking to get through this particular part to get into the tail and to try to mop up the innings as quickly as possible. So yes, it's an important partnership once again. And this is the nature of Test cricket. If you win one day, that doesn't mean you win the Test match because it really involves that consistent effort all the way through, which is why it's called Test cricket and why I'm sure Jason Holder and Joshua De Silva and the rest of the batting to come will know that they have quite a bit of work to do still before they can start think of putting pressure on England in the second innings. Yeah, Faz, what would you like for the strategy? Craig Brathwaite and uh, coach Andre Coley, day three in this, in this test match. What ideally do you think would be the strategy for the West Indies um, and where they would want to be at at the end of day three? Well, again, a lot depends on how the West Indies go on from 351 for five. If they are cleaned up pretty early and trail by 30, 40 runs, uh, the, 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 the tactics might be different. If they get a lead, even a nominal lead or a big lead, then, then again, it, it, it might be a situation where they might want to attack a bit more. But I think more than anything else, more than anything else, especially because the pitch is going to remain good for batting, certainly on the third day, might start to deteriorate going into days four and five. And, and we, we think now, given the way things have gone, it should go that far. But we'll have to wait and see. That's where the consistency comes in with the bowlers. You don't necessarily have to be going into all-out attack. But what you have to do is to be consistent. You've got to bowl one side of the wicket, work out your plans. If you if you have identified someone as a weakness to the short ball, go after him early. I was actually surprised that with Mark Wood generating so much pace that they didn't have a short leg from, from early on. And then you eventually saw the short leg and the problems created and Brathwaite eventually fell to Gus Atkinson. So it's about recognizing the moments immediately, but also having the quality in your bowler and the discipline in your bowlers to be able to deliver. And finally, and most importantly, for as we saw yesterday, you have to be able to take your catches. Yeah. If you want to win test matches, that's why it's, it's all those elements really have to come into play. Yeah, Faz, in just a moment, I want to present some stats that I prepared with uh, Shubman Gill and uh, Alec Athene, something that I've beefed about so many times on the show before, about where the two careers have gone since they both starred at the 2018 Under-19 World Cup. But before I get there... You were just projecting the possibilities for this uh, test match and how the West Indies can take charge of the match. Um, a key part of that, I would think, is the fitness of Shamar Joseph. Can you say anything about his readiness? Because um, his quality could assist the West Indies when they bowl again in propelling them into a position that they could win this test match. I really wish I could enlighten you uh, on, on that, lands, but we don't get a lot of detail from, from the West Indies team set up as to the, 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 the nature of individual players' injuries or fitness. We are still assuming that these issues have been related to cramp and, and shortage of work rather than being any serious muscle injury. And, and that's as much as we know at, at this point. So uh, all I can tell you at this stage is the, the understanding that we have is that the West Indies have no fitness issues with the bowling attack up to this point. But we'll have to wait and see when they bowl in the second innings. OK, well, let me get to those stats I prepared now, Faz, because... Um, and let me say before I start that I know that in sport, not all athletes in their late teens transition into superstars. There are, there are players in whatever sport who don't actually make the transition to become world superstars. So I'm not suggesting that this is a, a tragedy, but it just happens for me in West Indies a little bit too, too often. So at the 2019, 2018 on the 19 World Cup, um, Alec Athenes was the leading batsman in the entire tournament. And um, Shubman Gill was the player of the tournament for India, but he didn't score as many runs as, as Alec Athenes did. So let, let's look now at what the two men have done since their 2018 um, sojourn at the Under-19 World Cup. And you'll see the clear stats uh, presented where Shubman Gill 
has had huge success for India, and um, Athenes has had moderate success for the West Indies. And um, Gill, I would think, let me, I think it's harder to make the India team than it is to make the West Indies team. So it's a plus to Gill that he made the Indian team first of all and played so many tests and so many one-day internationals. And in every single statistic, he has outperformed Alec Athenes. Now, I'm not saying this to speak disparagingly of Athenes. In fact, it's quite the opposite because his batting today reminded us of his talent, his obvious talent. But there is an issue, Faz, with uh, the infrastructure of West Indies cricket where we transition talented players into world beaters, and it almost never happens. And I, I, think, I think that's a problem. It is a major problem, and, and I'm glad the way you framed the discussion, because people always, you know how thin-skinned we are in the Caribbean. The first thing that is, you like somebody, you don't like somebody, if you're offering any sort of critical analysis. I think what is the fundamental difference, which is what you touched on, is the environments of the two different players. Shubman Gill is in a highly competitive, world-class, top-of-the-table environment where if you don't deliver, you basically have to go and find something else to do. And clearly, you, if you do well at under-19 level, playing for India, and you, and, and you want to really move up to the senior international team, you better be able to deliver with bat or ball, whichever is your specialty, and deliver almost at the immediate point of asking and do so consistently because there are at least five or six high-quality players waiting to take your spot. Unfortunately, that is not the situation in the Caribbean, which is why the, the, I've, I've made the point many times over and others who were far more experienced than myself would have said the same thing. We seem to want to celebrate mediocrity. Uh, and therefore, you have an environment where players averaging in the high 20s or low, low 30s are commanding places in a West Indies test team. And therefore, if you have someone like an Alec Athanas, who, as you said, would have done so well at the 19 level, goes into the regional setup where the scores tell their own story, where the individual performances tell their own story, where is the motivation? Where is the, the, the environment? that demands the best of you. It doesn't exist at this time. And that's why it's credit to both the, the, the two Dominicans for the way they play today. A pity that Athanas didn't go on to get the 100. But but surely, it, we, we, we need to return to that environment, Lad, because it's, it's sort of like the Jamaican track and field environment. You feel coming out of the junior setup in Jamaica, you could expect to run 10.2, 10.3 as a male sprinter and expect to be anywhere near the Olympics or World Championships. No, but in, an, in another environment where, the, where it's mediocre, you, you'll probably be seen as a superstar. So, so this is the situation that, that we have allowed to deteriorate to the level. And you have a lot of apologists and so on, not just at the grassroots level, but at the administrative level, who seem comfortable with a situation where superb talent, brilliant talent, is allowed to just wither on the vine because of this environment of mediocrity. And when you see days like this, or days like at Headingley in the 2017 Test match or at Southampton four years ago, it, 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 it almost puts an even greater focus lens that if we could only return to an environment that demands, not requests, not, not, not politely asks, but insists and demands consistent excellence without any apologies, only then will we really have a chance of returning to a consistently high level in Test Match cricket. Yeah, and what's for sure, Faz, is a lot of work have to be done and, you know, we really just have to trust in the administration and hope that we can get it right someday. We want to thank you, as always, for joining us here on the Sports Max Zone and I'm really looking forward to day three to see how it turns out. So... Hopefully, we chat on Monday. Let's see how it goes. Yes, thanks. All right. Fazir Mohammed there, of course, our cricket analyst. And he's from Sweet Sweet Trinidad and Tobago. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back. Don't go anywhere.